Thanks for taking the time to listen to this weekly sermon from Southside Baptist Church in Florence, South Carolina. Our vision is to know God and make Him known. We now offer two services on Sunday mornings. Our classic service begins at 8.30 a.m. and our modern service is at 10.45. Please visit our website at southsidenow.church to find out more about how we are making disciples in the Florence area. For now, sit back and take in this week's message from God's Word. We, um, I tell you, as I mentioned, starting off our service, um, there is a rise more so than normal when it comes to people dealing with depression right now, especially when it comes to the subject of loneliness, of feeling lonely. Uh, we've been more isolated than probably any other time possibly in our lives. Now, maybe for some of you, you're Schedule hasn't changed that much. You're able to go into work. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But for some, some are concerned about their jobs. Some are concerned they're going to find a new job. Um, Divorce is on the rise. People are having to deal with some of the issues maybe they had ignored in their marriages. And because they're at home much, a lot more, they're, they're having to deal with uh, some of that, those relationship issues. Um, what's interesting is that Unfortunately, suicide is on the rise as well. Something I came across that I thought was very interesting was last year, more people committed suicide than there were homicides in America. Think about that. Man, that just kind of, kind of just hurts your heart. That there were people who gave up and concluded that life just wasn't worth living any longer. And they were, they were, they felt so alone. They felt so depressed. They felt in such a situation that it was time for them to end their life here on earth. I want you to know that there's hope in Jesus Christ. That even during our dark times, Jesus is there. He didn't say we'd go through difficult. They wouldn't go through difficulty. He didn't say we would have we would have trouble. But he did say that he would go with us through the trial. And the trials that come into our life. I want you to know that the season in which you're in. And this season that we all are in together. It one day, it will pass. They say that about every 10 years, every 10 years, there's a major event that a leader or a pastor or a business will have to deal with. 9-11 type things. Uh, Many of us have never been through a pandemic before. This is new. This is definitely a major event. Major events will happen in your life. And you have to lead through them, whether it's leading your children or leading your household, leading uh, your church in some capacity or leading uh, your business. It's something that we all deal with. When it comes to this subject today, though, we're going to be in Romans. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 12 and start in verse 9. The subject is authentic community. How God has called us to have community. That's part of what church is about. It's about loving one another, encouraging one another, ministering one to another. And that's what He has called us to. And if there's a time in which we see the importance of having authentic community, it is now. It is now. We need community. We need it. Sometimes in church, sometimes in church, sometimes a place in which we feel like we should be able to get help, to share with a close friend something going on in our life. Sometimes we feel like we have to put on a facade, that we have to put on a mask and pretend that everything's okay. And if we don't pretend everything's okay, then people are going to talk about me. Now, I'm not saying that none of us want to air our dirty laundry, and we shouldn't, really. But a church is a place in which we can, we can go and we can be healed. That, and when I say healed, I mean spiritually healed. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about that here this morning. And God, though, He desires for you, He desires for me to have authentic community. It is important. You know who struggles typically to have authentic community more than others? It's men. 
Women have a little easier time with it. I'm not saying women don't struggle with it, but men. You see, we as men, we may go and golf with one another. We may go and play tennis. We may go to a ball game, and there will be conversation. But even men need that close friendship with somebody. It said that one in ten men have a best buddy. One that they can confide in, one that they can say, hey, you know what, this is what I'm struggling with. I'm struggling in my marriage, or I'm struggling in this area with my thoughts, or I'm struggling here. We as men, we need that. Many men, unfortunately, our pride gets in the way. Our pride can get in the way and we think to ourselves, well, I'll just man up and I'll push through it. Sometimes that is the answer. But oftentimes when it comes to this kind of issues, we need authentic community. God build us that way. So notice with me, chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, and honor giving preference one to another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Notice the first part of this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Some Bible versions will say, let love be sincere. This, these two words, sincere and hypocrisy, uh, a, they re- reference to a Greek word that literally means without a mask. See, the Bible says you don't need to wear a mask, right? That, don't quote that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. What's the mask it's referring to? It's referring, it's referring to ancient Greek theater, where all the actors were males. Sorry, ladies. You couldn't be an actor back then. I don't know why. But all of them were males. And what would happen is the actors would play many different parts. They may play two or three male parts. They may, they'll play a woman. They'll play a child. And what they would do, they would do a couple things. One, they would throw their voice, right? They would try to talk like a lady, which, by the way, is always an ugly sound. It is. You know it is. I would mimic it, but I don't want to embarrass myself. But they also would wear a mask, for each character in which they had. And so that's where we get the word hypocrite. They were putting on a mask, trying to be something they were not. For authentic community and genuine love to occur between two followers of Christ, you need to take off the mask. You need to take off the mask and don't put the facade on. And listen, I've been in church my entire life. Many of you have been in your church uh, most of your life. You've seen it before, where church just becomes a place where, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to pretend like everything's great and cool, and I'll say calm and collective, and I'll just pretend. But that's not authentic community. That's not what God designed the church for. He designed it so we could come together to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to get help. But you know what, there's not one perfect church Every church is full of imperfect people who at times need help. At times they need prayer. At times they need someone just to come alongside them and put their arm around them and go, you know what? I don't know how it's going to be okay. I don't know how God's going to work this out, but God's going to work it out. And I'm praying for you. I really am praying for you. John 13 tells us this. John 13, it says, These are the words of Jesus. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And you and you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus says, here's a new commandment. Here's something that you need to know that you need to be reminded. Notice, notice what Jesus said. He said, he, he commanded them, not, not about strategy, not about doctrine. And strategy and doctrine are very, very important in church. But he, he, he commands them how they treat other Christians. Think about that. Jesus said, I'm not giving you a new commandment about doctrine, about strategy, or about what to argue about. I'm commanding you... To love one another. 
how you treat your brother and sister in Christ matters to God. It matters to you. Because authentic, authentic community matters to him. He commands us to love one another the same way which he loves us. He loved them unconditionally, sacrificially, openly, vulnerable, and even when it was not convenient. Now I want to say this, though. Sometimes, in fact, but preacher, there's some truths that need to be spoken. In fact, there are times in which you can't really love somebody unless you tell them the truth. And there's some tough, tough things sometimes in our own families, in our own marriages, in our own communities that are tough subjects. And just because we talk about the truth, that we talk about the facts, that we talk about what, what, what God's Word says... It can be mistaken for hate when, in fact, the truth given should always be given with love. I always say this, Christian, make sure that when you give the truth, that you also give it with love. We should have both. If you give love with no truth, you're not really showing them love. You're really not. We are called to love. We are commanded to love. You see, Jesus, he met them right where they were at. And he loved them just the way they were. But I want you to know something. Jesus will change you. When you give your life to Christ and you become born again, he will do the changing. And he was calling them to emulate him in their relationships with one another. Why? Because authentic community is powerful. It's something that we long for. It goes way beyond simply being a team Or being part of a club, authentic community occurs when the real you shows up, meets real needs for the right reason in the right way. And this is what he also tells them here in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. That's That's where the truth part comes in. Sometimes it's tough to give the truth, but you really can't show love until you give the truth. And he's saying, I want you to abhor, what is this word, kind of give you an idea of how strong of a word this is. Imagine, imagine you're in your vehicle, you go to the airport, you're going on vacation, and you're in a rush to make, uh, to make your, your, your time, your flight, and so you, you get in and you're gone for two or three weeks. You don't think anymore about your vehicle, your whole family's in, you know, on the flight together. You come back after your vacation and you start to open the door, but you forgot something. You forgot, and every parent has done this before, you forgot about the diaper that was underneath the seat. And when you open the door, the wall of smell smacks you right in the face. And you know immediately... Somewhere in this car, there's a dirty diaper. That is what the word abhor means. And listen, church, there's some things that we should hate. It says it. But make sure it's what God hates. You say, God doesn't hate anything. Read the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. There's seven things that God hates. I'm not preaching about that today. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. Some of y'all know I went up and I preached at, um, at Hillcrest Baptist Church, Richmond, Indiana. My pastor, uh, my friend is a pastor up there. And um, back when I was a youth pastor there, uh, I don't know, 12 years ago, and uh, so I'm there, and we were doing a summer series on the book of Proverbs. And I didn't know what I wanted to preach, but I, I, wanted, to preach, um, I wanted to preach the passage of, of Proverbs 6 about that part of the things that God hates and what we should do. And I didn't know what to title it. So I told the secretary, who's still the secretary there, Janie, I told her, just write in quotations, I hate. That's when, like, when the iPhone came out, so I thought I was being cool. So I had like a little, you know, a, a smaller lowercase I and then hate capitalized. I'm like, that'd be, that'd be good. Well, they made a poster and they sent the poster out to all the members and in the community. And underneath my picture, it said, 
I hate, and underneath it, Proverbs. <clears throat> True story. I hate Proverbs. I don't hate Proverbs, but I thought that was interesting. I, I'd share that with you. Where are we? Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Let me ask you, are you clinging to what is good? I mean, are you clinging to what is good? And there's a time in our society today where the, they, the Satan wants to um, kind of blur the lines on what is good and what is evil. I mean, really, that's what's going on in our society. That's what our media is doing, of blurring the lines of what is evil and, and, and what is good. And, and some wonder, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line in society? Where do you eventually draw the line and say, you know what? You can't go past this. This is sin. Is it, you know, 20 years ago, there's people that they have different views now than 20 years ago because the line was moved by the media. And therefore, eventually, society ad adapted to it. In five years, ten years, how many years, the line will be moved again in the efforts of move, to move society even further down the road of sin. Where will you draw the line? I'm going to draw the line with the Word of God. Where God says, nope. And where God says, gives a thumbs up. That's where I'm going to draw it. And that's what it's saying here. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And it may mean you need to fight for it. You see, when you cling to what is good, it's going to affect the way you walk. I'll prove it to you. I have three kids. If you have children, grandkids, niece, nephews. You ever seen a kid cling to your leg? You try to walk with them, right? You walk like this. You're lugging them around. What you cling to will affect how you walk. Cling to what is good. You see, authenticity is only part of the equation. So many of us unknowingly ask the wrong questions when it comes to the issue of sin, about clinging to what is good and abhorring what is evil. Instead of running towards righteousness and to what is holy, what we know is right in His Word, what happens is we end up asking the wrong question. We end up asking, how close can I get to sin without crossing the line? And, and so what happens is we ask, how much can I drink before it's sin? How much money can I have before it's considered greed? How much can I bend the truth and spin the story before it's a lie? We all have done this to some degree, and as Christians, we, when, we, when we do that, we give a little, we continue to cross the line. The closer you get to that line, the easier it is to cross. And once that pattern develops, little private sins start to take root. They start to take root. And you see, this passage we're reading here of Romans 12, 9 through 13, it's not speaking of sinless perfection. But it does speak of walking in honesty and integrity. Because church, I want you to know something. There's not one perfect person here. There's not one person here that, that in our lives that we need to confess every day and confess to God of the sin that is in our life to keep us clean, right? Think of it like um, confessing uh, and going right to God. You don't need a priest. You don't need to come to me and tell me all your sins. I'm here to listen. I'm here to help you any way I can. But you see, th there's no one between you and God any longer because of what Jesus Christ did. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. You don't need anyone else according to Scripture. You can go right to Him. But I want you to know something. God's, God's love flows through clean vessels. And the Holy Spirit is not going to stay in a vessel you being that vessel, if you're not clean and right with him. He's going to say, I, I can't stay there. Doves like clean water. Doves like clean air. They're not going to stay where it's filthy. So it's important that we confess our sins. And while we have to deal with the sin of the flesh, we don't have to be underneath the power of it. And some believers, they're set free, but they're still living underneath the bondage of sin. And they're wondering, why, why, am, why am I not, why don't I feel free? Because you're not clinging to what is good. You're not confessing your sin and making things right with God. You're living under the bondage when you could be free. 
you can be free. I want to show you a Bible verse I don't have here up on the screen, but it's in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. I really, I've, read, I've been reading Romans 8. I love Romans 8 quite a bit um, the last week or two. And uh, Romans 8, verse 5. I just want to show you one Bible verse that I believe will help somebody when it comes. And, and, and chapter 8 starts off with talking about how there's no condemnation. In other words, the act of declaring guilty on any believers any longer. And how we can live in the Spirit, but we also battle this flesh. But notice what it says in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, why is this? This is talking to believers here. Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So we see, underline that part, set their minds on things. What are you setting your mind on? Are you setting your mind on what is good? Or are you setting in your mind on what the God calls evil? Because this flesh is going to veer towards evil. It's going to veer towards what the flesh wants. And the Spirit of God is going to, it's going to veer me to what the Spirit of what God wants. And what He has, has shown and revealed in His Word. So where are you at? How are you doing? Is there a private sin in your life that needs to come in the light? Are you tired of hiding and pretending? Of feeling guilty? My friend, you need to go to someone you can trust. That's a believer in Christ. Whether it's one of our connection group leaders, someone on staff, another mature believer that's here in the church, and get help. That's what authentic community is about. It's about going to other people. Because, listen, you may think to yourself, it's my sin, it's private, it doesn't hurt anybody else. And that's one of the lies from the enemy, by the way. That's one of the lies. It won't hurt anybody else. It's a lie. Notice here, chapter 12, verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are a body of believers. And so it just takes one part of the body to be injured or infected where it affects everyone else. You don't believe me? I mean, just stub your pinky toe. You feel like your whole foot, you, you know, you're trying to protect your whole entire foot. Just take a, um, an earache and it just ruins, it ruins your day. My son Grant had, has an earache for the last two days. Probably take him to the doctor Monday, you know, and giving him some medicine, trying to help him out and waking you up in the middle of the night. So if you're saying, preacher, you look tired this morning. It's because that kid. You see, the problem of sin doesn't always just affect us privately. It affects those around us. And it affects your family more than than you realize. There's a story, I'm I'm not going to turn to it, but it's in Acts chapter 5. It's a story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you know the story, if you've heard it before, but for those who had not heard it before, the story is about this. It's about the early church. In the early church, there was no, when, when one would come to Christ, many were kicked out of their families. Or they'd lost their jobs because they became a Christian. There was no stimulus package to help them. There was no a welfare system to say, you know what, we'll at least have food for you. There, there was none of that. And so the early church was coming together. They were poor. They didn't have money. But some did have money. And some were selling land. They were selling possessions and items to support one another. It's what they did. And so some were selling land and, and bringing it before the apostles. And Ananias and Sapphira had sold some land. And they brought the money before the feet of, of the Apostle Peter and said, here it is. Now, if they had come and said, here's, here's, here's part of what we decided to give to the Lord, and we've kept some of it, they would not have been sinning. But they wanted to fit in. And so they lied. They lied to the Apostle Peter. And so when um, Ananias came in first... And Peter kind of gave him a chance to repent and to make things right. Is this all the money from the land? They didn't have to sell the land. They chose to sell the land, and they chose to lie. And he said, oh, yeah, that's all of it. Boom, he died in a church service. Can you imagine someone dying right here, and the deacons drag him off? Like, oh, man, got my attention. Sapphira wasn't in there, and she comes. He asked her the same thing. She lies. Boom. She's dead. Her husband's not even buried yet. 
I say all this to say this. To point out, God takes authentic community seriously. As I mentioned, I've been in church, been a pastor, been involved. I don't come from a family of pastors, but a family of faithful men in churches. And there's something my father taught me. My father taught me, he said, and some mentors in my life. He said, there will be problems in churches because there's people there. But I want you to know something. Never, never hurt the church because you get upset. There are things worth fighting for. False doctrine, right? There are things worth going to war for. Absolutely. But there are some things that are not. Never hurt the church. If you're in church long enough, at some point in time, I promise you, you'll get hurt. I've been. I've been hurt before in church. And you have a choice either to rear your ugly head and, and make a scene. In fact, Dave Ramsey, the financial guru, said this about churches. He said, if you've never been hurt in church, it probably means you never were involved. It's true. It's part of it because human beings are messy. Now, I, I say that for this reason, because w- w- fellowship is, and unity is important to God. It really is. And I will say this, church, I say this because I've seen it as a pastor and not as a pastor, that when someone, someone shows themselves and hurts the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ, hurts the, hurts, hurts the bride of Christ, destroy, hurts the fellowship, and it's not over a doctrinal matter, it's not over something of sin, okay, but it's over the issue of because one had a preference over another preference, and they make an ugly, ugly scene. Listen, I have seen people that are now with Jesus who are no longer here on earth, I believe, because of that reason. I've seen people get into a situation where they are injured, then their wife is injured, then other people are injured or a part of their family. And listen, you can say, well, that's just, you don't know that for sure. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. But when you see it, and you see it multiple different times of someone trying to break the, listen, why, what am I saying? Authentic community is important to God. Because we as a people, people of God, we're going to disagree at times. Just like any family. We're going to get mad at each other from time to time. Just like any family. Not my family, but your family. God wants authentic community. Notice with me in verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference one to another. See, authentic community demands the real you meets real needs. You see, it says, Be devoted one another in brotherly love. The fact is we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with something in our lives. But both... Uh, both hypocrisy and sin are like bacteria. Once they are brought to the light, the power to infe- in, infect and inflict disease is removed. And bring any secret sins or temptations in the light of God's presence and, and, and get, get help from a trusted friend so that you can heal. This is what the book of James says. James chapter 5 verse 16 says this. It says, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. And listen, the enemy loves to tell us that you're the only one going through or struggling with that sin. And it's just another line which he gives. One of the brothers and sisters in Christ, we end up finding mentors. We end up finding accountability partners. They can say, you know what? I've been through what you've been through. I've been through what you've been through. And we need that brother and sister in Christ who comes alongside of us and says, you know what? I may not even know what you're going through completely because I haven't been there, but I love you and I'm praying for you. Sometimes those are some of the best words that you can say to somebody. The enemy wants to cause shame. He wants to cause shame to stunt your growth in Christ. He wants to cause shame in your life. And so you're... That, they, that, that you think... The enemy wants you to think that you can't help anybody else because of your shame. It's just another lie from the enemy. Confess and replace that lie with the truth of James 5, 6. Confess your sins with one another that you might be healed. So what's keeping you from experiencing authentic community? Notice verse 11. 
not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This not lagging in diligence, what does it mean exactly? It means pursuing excellence, pursuing and doing what is right, not being not being slothful, I guess you could say, or slow or delay. We really don't use the word slothful, really, but we do use the word lazy. And the church isn't a place for laziness. It's a place of excellence because of who we are. We are the bride of Christ. We are given a mission of reaching people. We should do the best we can to with our facilities, and we do. Man, you get, man, so many of you have stepped out and helped out. And not just that with our facilities, but also when it comes to loving people who come to the doors. If you're a member here, and you're a member here, you should always, every Sunday morning, be looking, who can I welcome here to the church that's new? Who can I welcome to who is new here? And we have, man, we have, I, I think we have some all-stars here in our church, we really do. But some of you kind of wait back. God expects you to pray for the church's growth, to be looking for new people, to show your friendly faces, and, and, to, and, and to welcome those who are here. It matters. It makes a difference. You see, laziness is a failure to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And something that drives me crazy is when we think that the church isn't a place for excellence. It is the church. I had a mentor. He went home to be with the Lord this week. And, um, and I'm sure he's shouting in heaven. He was 90 years old. He's a pastor friend of mine. And I um, haven't seen him in probably about five years. But he, uh, he's with the Lord now. But something he would always stress was having excellence in church. That everything that we do should be done with excellence. He would tell us as he mentored many of us, uh, now preachers, many of the men that I, I'm thinking of, he would always mention something to us. He's, he would say, he always called us boys. He said, boys, when you're a pastor one day, don't you dare stoop to be a king. Okay. Don't stoop to be the CEO of Ford or GM. What he was saying was this, was the church is the answer for the world it deals with the eternal. Everything else deals with the temporary. We are dealing, the church is the most important institution in the world. It is His answer for the world that is armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is, it, it is what we are called to. If there's anything that should be done with excellence in this world, it is a church. It is a church. And it, man, it just fires me up when there's this idea that church should not be done with excellence. Whether it's a country church, whether it's a foreign church, whether it's a city church. And, and man, I love preachers. I do. I do. But, but there are some lazy preachers that, man, you need to get on ball and get your stuff together and lead like a man in your church. That's what we're called to do. Lead, even when it's difficult. Even during this season, which may be difficult, for, for, it's difficult on everybody. Lead. That's what you're called to do. You're not called to please everybody. You're called to lead and do everything with excellence and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no room for laziness. Maybe in your life. Maybe in your life in, the, in serving. I know this can be a tough time, a tough season of serving with everything going on. I, I get that. And I'm, please, if, if you've got to take some health precautions and you're able to do certain things you normally you know, we're doing in the past. I, I get that. And I'm not, I'm not speaking to you. But we can easily in our life go through the motions. And what we used to be passionate about, what we were passionate about before, just become more like a job or a duty. And that, I believe that's what this is speaking of. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And, and so if we're not careful, we can begin to do the right things without any passion. What we used to delight in becomes a duty. Our tithe turns into paying one more bill when it's an act of worship. 
our small group or our, our connection groups become just a commentary we read. God becomes something on our to-do list rather than something that we, someone we, we worship. And, and so why, what has happened? What's happened to the passion in the serving of the Lord? You're doing it for the wrong reasons. See, so often authentic community does not happen because people's motives are not focused on serving God but on using Christian community as a means to heal personal wounds of the past and gain affirmation. And it is a place to come and be healed. But it's also a place you come and you serve. A place that you come and you do what you do, not for people, but first and foremost, for God. Anything that you do in a church... The first reason you do it is because you realize you're doing it unto the Lord, regardless of what you do here at Southside or any other church. The secondary reason is for people. It's a secondary reason. But when those get mixed up, our passion eventually will wane. If we're not recognized the way we want to get recognized, we're probably doing it for people rather than for God. Because when you're doing it for the Lord, you know He sees all and He knows all, and He will reward you according to your works. Don't worry about the rest. Don't worry about the rest. You see, here's an acid test for knowing whether you're serving God or serving yourself for the approval of others. How? It's, it's how you respond when you're treated like a servant. It's true. How do you respond when you're treated like a servant? If you respond and your first response is, I'm out of here, I'm gone. Maybe doing it for the wrong reasons. When we respond in grace and forgiveness and realize that, hey, we have areas always to improve, always to do better because we're doing it unto the Lord and your focus is on Him, you're not near as worried about what other people may say. Not that you should ignore. Sometimes people are right, right? Sometimes people who, you know, may uh, uh, say something, it's wise to listen. But when you're treated like a servant, though, when you're treated less than, how will you respond? It will show who you're doing it for. You see, authentic community demands an upward and outward focus. Notice verse 12 and 13, we'll finish this up. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given the hospitality. Someone said, your outlook will determine your outcome. I believe this to be true. When I am tired, overwhelmed, underappreciated, my focus turns inward. We begin to think about what we don't have or who is not... Uh, been coming through for us. We focus on, the, on, on prayers and we have not been answered in relationships that are troubling and we lose focus. Instead of looking upward, we end up looking inward. And God has called us to keep our focus on Him. And we're focused on Him. We can rejoice in the hope. We can have joy in the middle of difficulty. You know, that's the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness can change real quick for all of us. I love ice cream. Some of you have known that. And um, I won't mention what kid it is because he's in here. I don't want to embarrass him. But I love ice cream. I love homemade ice cream. And one of my kids got into my homemade ice cream. I was not happy in that moment in the middle of the night, 1 o'clock, getting ice cream. I was not happy. But I still had joy. Still had joy. You see, you can have moments in your life you're not happy. But when you are focused in serving God and loving Him and doing what He calls you to do, you can still have that joy even in the midst of your difficulty, even when life isn't going the way you want life to go. And that's where we're all at right now. Let me ask you do you have joy right now? I'm not asking if you have happiness. There's things I'm not happy about, there's things you're not happy about but I still have joy because I know who's on the throne. I know who's in control and I know I can worship him and have joy in the middle of it. James tells us this, James one, James says, my brother, count it all joy. That's why you can have joy when you fall into various trials, 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Then there's an outward focus. An outward focus. And James speaks to this. Let me just stop right here before we get into the outward focus part. You're here and you're focused on God. You're like, preacher, I love God. I'm doing things from God. I just don't like people. I'm just not in the mood for people right now. Been on Facebook, see what people say. Been on Twitter. If you really want to get beat up, just go on Twitter and post a lot. It's a brutal place. Social media can drag you down. It can drag you down during this time. Like, I'm just going to... I'm going to worship God and I'm going to seclude myself and I don't have to deal with any as a Christian because I've been hurt before, preacher in church. <clears throat> you see, that's not where we should stop as Christians. We need to forgive. We need to move on. Because part of living for the Lord is dealing with people. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Notice what James 2 says. It tells us. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, and what is a profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. My friend, if you think to yourself, I'm just going to have an upward focus and not ever focus outward on serving people, and I'll be okay in my faith. You are fooling yourself because of faith without works and fellowship and hospitality, as, as mentioned here, it is dead. And so I believe these early church members lived an authentic community with one another. And as a legitimate needs surfaced among them, they help meet those needs. They help love people, even those who hated them. They help love people who maybe, humanly speaking, didn't deserve it. They help love people who were even in a church that maybe even aggravated them. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say you've got to like everybody. But it does say you've got to love everybody. And there's some folks that you need more grace. More grace is required, so to speak. And I pray that you will not keep away from having an authentic community during this time of difficulty. That when you've been hurt in church, that you won't say, you know what, I'm done serving God. I'll do my own thing. I'll do my own church. Which is unbiblical, by the way. I pray that you will go and say, you know what, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to do what your word says. And I'm going to follow you regardless. Even if I get hurt by other people, I'm going to worship you because it's all, it's all about you. And I pray that if you don't know Christ this morning, I pray that you will accept him. That you will repent of your sins and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And I'll say this much about Southside. We have a great group of people here. We're not perfect, but I believe we love one another. I really do. And I believe there's some, I believe there's great, I know there's great people here that, that's, that have struggles, that have issues, that I know that God's going to use you in a mighty, mighty way. There's some here who've been through struggles that are here to help you, to pray with you, that have been where you have been. And don't let the enemy tell you any different. Let's pray. Father. I'm thankful for your love for us. I'm thankful, God, that for, for the community in which you've given us, our church community, and where we can love and be loved, where we can serve and be served, where we can help other people and be helped. That's what it's about. It's a place we, where we can minister one to another. Whether it's physical needs, whether it's spiritual needs, that we can help our brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that we don't lose sight of that during this time, of how much we need community, how much we need your grace. We love you. We praise you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen.